Welcome to the Corporate Treasury 101 podcast. A few weeks ago, we started our payment journey together with Hussan. Our objective is to break down and deep down all the payments method there is out there. Understand how they work from an end user and a corporate standpoint to finally develop on the implication for corporate treasury. After having discussed physical cash and bank notes, we wanted to talk about checks, this other paper-based instrument. In this episode, expect to learn what really are checks and what are the different types of checks there is on the market. What is checks clearing and how banks have digitized the checks processing? How corporates can use their own printer to print checks? The shift in use of checks in favor of their electronic format, the e-checks? And much more. It was good to sit together with Hussam and continue our payments journey. Checks are rather simple and straightforward, but it allowed us to really get into the details of certain very interesting topics. We hope you will enjoy the episode. If this is the case, please rate us on your favorite podcast app. And yeah, this is the best way to help us and it makes us very happy. On another note, we published an ebook. If you are dreaming of finding a book explaining the ABCs of corporate treasury, well, do not search anymore. We got you covered. Head to the link in the description to download it. And the best part, it is completely free. With all that being said, please welcome Hussam. And I. Hello, Guillaume. How are you doing? Hey, my Sam. Very good, thank you. How about yourself? Good. It's nice to just be the two of us again. We've had so many exciting interviews recently. Indeed. It's nice to just have... Home. Indeed, to do. It was an exciting lineup of guests coming. But... We wanted to jump back into our payment story, uh, as yep. you call it. So going through all the different methods of payments, uh, we've already talked about cash. Super interesting because we actually talked about how cash and bank notes, specifically mm -hmm. when we talk about cash, can actually be a hindrance to corporate treasures, um, yep. which was very interesting and was what definitely my main takeaway. So uh, moving on from that, what's next in the story? I think we are going to talk about checks, right? So. Start yes. with the very basics. What is a check? Yes. So the idea is indeed to continue with the paper-based instruments, and we will very soon jump into the more electronic formats. But checks, most of the people may have heard about it. But it's a good question to start with, uh, because in some countries, those are not used at all anymore or since decades. So yeah, let's start with a little reminder. So it is what we call in treasury a paper-based instrument. And when I say instrument, I mean payment instrument. It's a piece of paper indicating an amount to be paid on person or entity to another. It is really dated and signed by the person who issues the check and it orders a bank to pay the designated amount of money to the bearer of the check, the one indicated as the beneficiary on it. And uh, checks are like boomer technology, we call it. <laughs> yes. That's very very yes. very old school so uh, yeah it's absolutely it, you know i remember when i when i opened my first bank account i had a checkbook yeah i was like 11 i think i think that's the only time they gave them out they don't give them out anymore so it's a it's still a practice in the uk you know or or, or is it not very, it's very, like i said very very rarely very very rarely like i said you don't get them anymore i think business accounts still get them uh but uh, yeah. personal accounts uh not really yeah, that would make sense. No, yeah. yeah, so, so you... to the risk to offend some of our auditors, it's indeed what we can call a boomer technology, but uh, quite <laughs> handy in some situations. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's indeed not the most favorite of, uh, of us uh, right now. So you said the word beneficiary there. What did you mean by that exactly? Like, Yeah, so beneficiary, uh, we already touched upon the, this topic throughout our last, what, 65 episodes, um, is the person who received the money, right? But in the case of a check, there is a certain jargon applying here. I think it's good to um, set a little bit this in the landscape that we're going to go through. So the person to whom the check is written to is known as the payee. This is the beneficiary, but in the check's jargon, we call it the payee, the persons to pay to. Um, the person writing the check um, is the person paying, and he or she is called the payor uh, or the drawer. And last but not least, an important term is the drawery, which is the bank on which the check is drawn. Okay, so the money 
is drawn from the bank account of I the see. payer. So the payer's bank account, uh, the money is drawn from that and credited to the bank account of the payee. Makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, that's it. And this is a typical scenario. The other possibility is for the check to be cashed. So what you just described is a deposited check. So you make me a check of $100. Uh, I go to my bank, I deposit it, and the money is created a few days later on my bank account. The other possibility is to have it cashed. So the payee gives the check to the bank and gets physical cash in return. So banknotes, the one we touched upon in our last episode of our payment story. Uh, did you ever watch the movie Catch Me If You Can? Yeah, absolutely. I felt you were going to come up with this reference. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so in, in, in those, the guy was committing fraud, right? And he was doing that by going around writing fake checks. But mm -hmm. um, he could get away with that because um, it was like the check wasn't immediately checked. Oh, as in like, let's say the pay, the amount in the bank account was not immediately confirmed, right? So yes, no reference about how cat checks work. So what if the person doesn't have money in the bank account? So um, those are two really good points here. The cash me if you can thing. So we're gonna come to it a little bit later on in this episode. But there are different types of checks. And what was this guy issuing were uh, cashier's checks. So he was forging signature and the number of the check, making it look like it was an official check from the bank, not a classical check as we are talking about right now. So the cashier's receiving this was indeed, oh, okay, it's an official check. I can, I can cash it out directly. I don't even need to check um, if, it's, if the money is somewhere on the bank account. We're going to come back to it in a second, but that's, that's how it went. Um, in the case, the payor doesn't have the required amount of money on his account. And that's indeed one of the issues with the check. Uh, if you compare it with physical cash, for instance, you actually don't know if the person writing your check actually has the corresponding account uh, amount, sorry, on his or her bank account. And if that happens, then we call it a bounced check uh, because the check will bounce once deposited at the payee's bank. Um, for the anecdote and the cherry on the cake, the payor will usually have to pay a fee to the bank in case he or she issues a check without the sufficient funds. And that might even be, depending on the scenario, also the case for the payee. Uh, if you come and deposit a check that bounces, your bank might charge you something, but it's uh, very usually the payor's account that is debited for that. Okay, so I'm, I'm just so that I don't get confused again, the mm -hmm. payee is the person who uh is the person that wrote the check right the payee is the person receiving the money so the person receiving the pay to yeah. okay so usually the payer is going to get charged extra so the person that exactly. wrote the check but sometimes it can even be the person that was given the check not knowing that it would bounce exactly yeah That's so you terms. might want to look at that and uh, manage a bit your comfortability risk in this <laughs> so how do you avoid that check to bounce or check from bouncing? so yeah, no, that's a, that's a good question. Um, as a payor, well, <laughs> the, the straightforward answer is you can make sure to have sufficient funds before issuing the check as the payor, so the one that is going to get debited the amount. And as a payee, there is not much you can do, actually, except to ask for a certified check. This one is a type of check where the bank of the payor uh, guarantees there is sufficient funds on the bank account used to issue the check. And in certain countries, the practice is even to um, get the specific amount of money blocked on a different account or like with a specific reference. So even if the person tries to withdraw money or then pay with his or her credit card to something else, this amount that has been issued for the check will be blocked. And so we make sure the amount is paid. I don't know if that is the thing in the, in the UK, but where I come from in France, we typically use certified checks for big transactions and especially between individuals. For instance, I bought my very first second-hand car with a certified check that I gave to an individual so he could be sure that uh, I had the money and the money was going to end up on his bank account. Wow. Okay, Boomer. Okay. Nice to, <laughs> nice to know about you. Nice to know about your check story. <laughs> so, yeah, a little bit of a Boomer, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so it definitely sounds safer to always make sure that you have this uh, uh, certified check, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the PE because then he knows or she knows that it will definitely get the money. Exactly. Uh, but also for both of you, because um, you might get the fee as well, right? But what was the advantage of using a check versus just paying with cash, for example? Yeah, so 
the biggest advantage, and you just named it, it's a kind of a guarantee for the payee. And it's um, compared to physical cash, you avoid also transporting a large amount of, uh, of physical cash. So it's less bulky. And uh, let's say you lose it or you get mugged. Uh, it's better to lose a shake than losing, I don't know how many amounts of hundreds of euros in, in cash. So it's much safer to transport, uh, less bulky. And also, if you lose it or worse, get mugged, uh, that can happen not in our beloved city of Brussels, but wherever you are in the world, the holder of the cheque won't be able to get the money anyways because the name of the payee must be written on the cheque and the cheque signed by the payor as well. So nobody can do anything from a cheque except for the payee uh, that is written uh, on the on the cheque itself. Okay, so you write the person who's to receive the money's name on it yes. as, and they need to what take ID or something like that to prove that they're the person due the money? So I don't think most of the bank branches actually go up till the, um, the check of the ID. But yes, in the scanning, um, in the scanning system, you also verify the signature. Uh, and mm -hmm. it's, it's much safer than just, just cash, for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are, what are the other pros and cons of checks? Why would we use one? Yeah, so it is safe. Um, and another perk uh, that, I mean, doesn't come across easily, but you can send it by mail, for instance, without too many risks. I know it's still a, a boomer's technology and boomer's process, but uh, it, it's still it's still a fact. And it can be seen as convenient for certain people. I tend to disagree with that. I very rarely have a pen with me, for instance. Uh, first, the need to go to a bank branch to cash it in and so on. That's, I mean, for me, that's, that's cumbersome. But some people see it as convenient when they compare it to cash, physical cash, I mean. Among the cons, though, uh, there are several. First of all, the time to effectively get your money uh, from when you receive the check until the moment it effectively is on your bank account is much, much longer than other payment methods. Uh, so you have the time to bring the check to a branch, the processing time, we will come to it in the second part of this episode. Um, and all this whilst hoping it doesn't bounce. So the other side of it is that it's still paper-based. So other me payment methods now exist that are 100% electronic and therefore much faster, if not real-time. Plus, and again, we're going to come to it in the third part of this episode, but um, corporate treasury wise, you usually have to pay your bank to collect checks um, as a corporate, usually not as an individual. But so a lot of cons, um, not many pros, but it also still is market practice in certain countries and areas of the world. Um, I'm thinking of the US, for instance, France, um, some corporates need to, to have this kind of payment collections methods. Yeah, proper boomer technology. There, you're talking about mailing physical pieces of paper. Nowadays, you can <laughs> yeah. you can Instagram DM a QR code and take a payment. True, <laughs> True. That's, the... that's that's another way to go. Well, it depends on the amount as well, right? Um, those technologies sometimes have a limit on the amount. On checks, it's uh, it's much smoother, but still, yeah, I agree. It's um, it tends to disappear for sure. I think the only way I've ever uh, used a check. My recent history is, I think I got a uh, tax return once from mm -hmm. the government, and then they emailed, they posted me a check, uh, which yep. I had to go to the bank account and cash in, which took me days, which was incredibly exactly. convenient. So, <laughs> so other than these normal checks and these certified checks, mm -hmm. are there other types of checks as well, or is it just those two? So there are many variations uh, of checks that exist, especially if we look country by country, um, and you, you named it exactly. Some countries require still to pay taxes by uh, uh, by checks uh, and other specific local requirements, but we're not going to get in the details of this. Common checks we can find, there is the cashless check. So that's the one we mentioned about Catch Me If You Can with the, the incredible Leonardo DiCaprio. So this starts to be a bit old school, but this is a check guaranteed by the bank of the payor and signed by a bank cashier, an employee at the bank itself. So that translates into the bank being responsible for the funds. And this type of check is also usually used for very large transactions. Another one type of check we can name is the bearer's check. So this is still a bit old school. So I'm going to say this term <laughs> quite a lot in this episode, but this actually removes the need for the payee to have his name written on the check. So here we are in a case where the bearers of the check allows whomever bears it to go to the bank and cash in the amount of money written on it. So that removes a little bit the, the, the advantage we named earlier, which is uh, only the person who has its name written on it can cash in. The bearer's check is a bit different because anybody can do so. 
And one last that I would like to mention is the post-dated check. This one um, has a cash-in date written on it, and the payee won't be able to get the money transferred before the due date, even if the check is presented before to any bank branch. And this, in particular, is used in some part in the world, like certain countries in Latin America, for instance. Okay, so and each of them, I guess, have like a different pro and con, right? So you have the normal check, which is just nice and simple. You have the certified check, which perhaps is a bit more cumbersome because you have to create a separate bank account and have a specific reference code set up for it, etc. But it's probably the safest, especially from mm -hmm. a bouncing point of view. Exactly. Uh, you have the cashier's check, which is a bit more guaranteed, right? Something perhaps more linked to a yep. company or to a bank. Mm -hmm. Um Bears check, which is just whoever holds it can cash it in, which is probably like, you know, the most versatile one, but lower security. And actually, I'd heard about post dated checks, but I never knew what they were. So that's when you can only cash in after a certain date. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And this can be seen as a way to fulfill um, payments delays and, like, you know, payments accords that you have between two parties. Okay, I'm paying you when I receive the when I receive the merchandise or the stock, whatever. But I'm paying you 30 days later. I'm already going to write you a check, so you're sure that I'm going to pay you. But I'm also going to make sure you can only cash it in in 30 days as our payment terms uh, mentioned. This is a bit the idea here. Mm, okay, so this goes back to our supplier and payment terms conversation. Exactly. Almost. Okay, very, very clear. Thank you, Guillaume. Pleasure, my Sam, and see you very soon for the part two. Where So this first episode was probably um, common knowledge for most of the people. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we set the scene properly. And now we're going to go into checks clearing and processing and hold, how the whole things work on the corporate and bank side. And this is where it starts to get very interesting. Okay, so we've gone through, Guillaume, the, um, how checks work from the end user point of view, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I receive a check or if I'm issuing a check, how I would do that, the different types of checks and whatnot, right? Yeah. Um, how does that then happen on the bank side? Uh, what's yeah. the processing behind that look like? How does the bank confirm all these things? Yeah. So as uh, we were talking about a few seconds earlier, Hussam, this is where it gets exciting. So this is actually a good introduction, this question, to the term clearing. Um, this is a term that we will use more and more through our payments journey, and that is at the center of treasury activities in general. So in the context of a financial transaction, Clearing corresponds to all the activities from the moment a commitment is made until it is settled. And by settled, I mean the money is on the account of the beneficiary. Those transactions that are cleared can be checks, of course, but also electronic payments, uh, foreign exchange deals, trade transactions, and all the financial transactions you can think of. Long story short, clearing means transforming the promise of a payment, whatever it is, into an actual movement of money from account A to account B. A being the payer, of course, and B being the payee. Yeah, so it's when the actual money moves in the background after the check has been issued. Exactly. From the moment right. it gets out of your bank account, let's say, and it arrives to mine. This is the settling and the process is clearing indeed. So on the back end then, Guillaume, what does that mm -hmm. actually happen in the check? So when you do a check clearance, what happens? Mm -hmm. So clearing for checks is mainly one thing. Bank receiving the check, verifying that the amount written on it is actually supported by a sufficient balance. Those are, uh, those are some uh, tricky words. And, but it makes sense somehow, right? As far as the bank is concerned, if I, Guillaume, go to my bank with a check of, let's say, $100 that you wrote me, Hussam. Technically, it is just a piece of paper with the name on it and the number written. So how does the bank that I'm depositing the check to uh, actually knows at the moment I am depositing it whether you, Hussam, have the money to pay me those $100 or not? Does that make sense? Okay, but then how does the bank verify that? So this is where the check's clearing enters into action. So the payees bank, remember the payees is the one receiving the money. The payees bank will send the check to the payors bank. So this one can control whether there is sufficient funds on the account or not. If that is the case, well, I will receive my $100. And if not, I won't. And you will probably be charged a fee for issuing a bounced check. Yeah, that's what we discussed earlier, right? 
that the if the money is not there, then I get charged for writing a check that got processed, but there wasn't any funds behind that, right? Exactly. If you do not have a sufficient balance, then the check bounces indeed. But then does the bank have to send that check to the other bank? Is that not mm -hmm. like relying on the post? So this is indeed how it's used to happen. Uh, the bank's actually sending the physical check to other banks. But now, obviously, and I think it's somewhere around 1980, but I will need to double check these dates. Anyways, so it's quite, quite some decades ago. Uh, banks now have a system allowing them to scan the checks and send an electronic version of it to the payers bank for the payers bank to check uh, that the amount written on it is indeed supported by a sufficient balance. So this is what we call a check truncation. But this process still takes time because of all the verifications needing to be done, plus the time to scan the checks in the proper place and so on. Okay, so... If that's an internal account to account transfer, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but Indeed. otherwise, these banks need to all communicate with each other, right? So, what do they do? Scan it and email it as a PDF? Or how do they <laughs> talk between each other? Has it got something to do with Swift? Ah, that's Have we a talked very about good Swift point. before. So Swift is indeed a way banks communicate between each other. Um, this will be more for international transaction. That's something a bit separate, but you can indeed uh, make the link with this. So the banks can indeed hardly communicate with all the other banks there is in the world, right? Or even if we take just one country, it's hundreds of banks, hundreds of addresses and so on. So it's not really sustainable. What happens is that the banks use third parties that we call clearing houses. And clearing houses is again a very important term. We will not get into the details of what a clearing house is in this episode, but here is how it works for checks. In the United States, for instance, banks actually send a scanned copy of the check to the Federal Reserve Bank, the Fed, who then forwards it to the payers bank for checking. It makes it much easier to deal with uh, because it's only one central entity, right? All the banks need to be connected with the Fed, but not all the banks need to be connected with all the other banks. And that avoids the tremendous amount of connections uh, that would be required. Okay, so it's like a hub and spoke model, we call it, right? So you have the central Fed, which all the different mm -hmm. banks connect to, and then you go through the Fed for each of them. Exactly. So Bank Hussam, let's say, sends the check to um, the Fed first, and the Fed then sends the check uh, to Guillaume's bank to check whether the amount is available or not. Okay. But the Fed is the US specific, right? How does that work in the UK, for example, where I'm from? <laughs> So for the UK, I understand you will ask the question. Uh, <laughs> but so the same system applies, actually. There is also a third party, except here we talk about the check and credit clearing company. And to tackle uh, potentially one of your following questions, all the countries will have such third party and such clearing house. Okay, so it's each individual one. But then even so, then, you still need to send that check digitally from the bank to the clearinghouse company or the fed and then they yeah. need to then communicate it onwards right so then you have a middle middleman yeah. um how long does that take in so, boomer time <laughs> so it got it of course varies uh, from country to country in the best cases this whole process even in an electronic way uh takes two business days and i will say up to five depending on the country and the connection if whether it's a small bank or if there are some additional checks to be done but so more if we talk, even more if we talk about foreign currency checks, uh, in, especially in restricted economies, but let's keep it simple here. And let's say we are in the domestic market. So uh, we will be both living in the US on the Californian coast, surfing every day, Hussam. And we keep the system simple. You issue a check in dollars towards me. And that's how it will take two to five uh, business days. Okay. Makes sense. And, but I guess it's quicker if it's like internal to the same bank, right? If it's just account to account, you don't need to go via the Fed if it's inside the same bank, I guess. Like always, spot on. Uh, exactly. Yeah. If it's, it, it, and it makes sense, right? If the bank um, just has to check one or two of its internal accounts, then it's much, much, much faster. Uh, so that will be one business day. So the check or the amount wouldn't be credited on the very same day. It will take one business day, but it's much faster faster than two to five, obviously. Okay, makes and that's I guess just to for the 
bank to confirm that there's actually funds in there, the check doesn't bounce. Exactly. Those kind of yeah. things. Yeah. It's the same, exactly the same checks. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. But Guillaume, let's tie this all back to corporate treasury now, right? Because we've it talked makes... a lot about how checks work, uh, different mm-hmm. types of check, again, inside a bank, how it works. But inside a corporation, would a company even use checks? Mm-hmm. So obviously, as you can imagine, uh, treasurers and finance departments try to um, pull away from uh, boomers' technology and so uh, the use of checks as well. Uh, reasons are obvious. Um, in the treasury department, finance department, and, I mean, overall in the company, we want as much electronic formats as possible, real-time or very close to real-time transactions uh, because it offers better visibility, faster, you can use the money for a longer time, etc. Because if you have to plan for five days of delivery of the money, that's five days on which you cannot invest it overnight, for instance. Uh, and also, uh, more importantly, safety. And as we discussed through, um, through this episode, checks are rather bad in all those aspects. So therefore, it is rather rare to have advanced treasury departments using checks for payments um, to the company suppliers for payroll, etc., for instance. The only exceptions I see are for very, very specific purposes, such as um, certain taxes that can be only paid that way in certain countries, big transactions with certain counterparties, donations, uh, for instance, like very small associations tend not to be able to receive other forms of payments. But again, it is really rare and treasury departments really strive to get away from checks. I guess there is some benefit, right? Like if you want to, <laughs> if you want to be a little bit shady and delay your money leaving your account by an extra five business days, you can always just use a check to pay people. Uh, that's that's an interesting point. When money's going yeah. out, right? That's an advantage to pay later. That's true. Um, but on the other hand, you don't know exactly every time how much time it will take, right? Between two to five days, but mm. so there will be still an uncertainty. On top of that, I think as we discussed with uh, Daniel Sanchez, at some point the, the trust and the partnership approach you can have with your suppliers and so on tend to apply here. So you don't want to, to be shady in the, in the payments delays, let's say, especially when it comes to big transactions, big corporation. You want as much trust and transparency and efficiency as, uh, as wanted. But that's indeed uh, something that people could put out. Yeah. I think I read somewhere once that some companies print their own checks. Is, mm-hmm. is that a thing that like you can print your own check? Yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting one, actually. Indeed. Um, so we, we may think when we talk about checks, this checkbook we, uh, we have as individuals, right? And that we can write checks on and so on. But corporates can actually print their own checks. Absolutely, Hussam. Again, it is rather rare, but still used in certain industries and all parts of the world. And the process consists of owning a secured and dedicated checks printer in-house, meaning in the company and print the payment checks you then need to uh, send or give to your payee. When the process is a bit more advanced, you can actually have an integration with your ERP, so Enterprise Resource Planning, that sends the payment details to the printer that automatically prints the check. But again, there is still some manual part in the process as you then need to send or give the physical check to somebody or to a bank branch. But why would you do that? Print the checks in-house. Yeah, what's the advantage so, of that? So the advantage is not to have some uh, some checkbooks compared to uh, compared to the traditional model, oh, right? And to like be able to print batches of checks, um, and it can be the supplier's payment terms. Like if your supplier only accepts checks, or the only other alternative is cash, but it's uh, considered not safe. You're like, look, okay, I'm okay to issue a paper-based instrument, and then I will just print them in-house mm. myself. The other reason I see is the, um, one of the checks we talked about was the post-dated check, right? You issue a check, but you say mm-hmm. you can only deposit it at a certain time. But at least you give it to your payee already that they can use however they want, but they will not be able to cash it in before the certain date. So that's, those are the advantages I see, which makes sense. Again, you would rather every time go for an electronic format, but some economies, some industries, uh, maybe in countries where, where electronic channels are not as advanced as in other countries, for instance, that's a good alternative. Okay. But could you get the banks to print those checks for you? Like, would you have mm. to do that yourself? Buying a printer and everything like that doesn't... I, mean, I don't think it's used enough for you to invest that energy into it. 
Uh, yeah. But there's still the advantage of having like custom checks printed. So do banks do that sometimes? Yeah, that's indeed uh, that's indeed another option. As a corporate, you can do that. So you need to make sure that um, your bank support this kind of requirements, right? Because it's it's rather specific. Here, the process would differ a bit, um, and to my knowledge, that will actually become an electronic check, so an e-check. The corporate orders the bank to issue an electronic check or checks to be printed, but the bank would like smoothen the process and proceed, but actually never prints the check. So it's basically just this scanned version that the banks exchange between themselves. We can call it this way. It will be in an electronic format. So this is the e-check, and it's basically a digital version of the paper check. What do you think, Usam? It's not uh, not so boomer anymore, right? That just sounds like a account transfer then, no? What's the difference between that and uh, just like a wire transfer of a, between accounts? Yeah, that's a, that's a very fair point. So the difference is um, indeed, let's say the, um, the line between the two uh, means of payments is much more blurry than in a paper check, obviously, because um, a check actually uses the ACH, so the Automated Clearing House Network. But I propose we keep this section for a future episode on our payments journey. But you're, you're very on um, spot on. The difference is rather small, to be 100% honest. Okay, but so we've always talked up until now about doing it as a payer, right? Yeah. Where you're okay. sending money, you're paying for things, you're issuing checks, yeah. right, for a corporate treasurer. What about mm -hmm. in terms of receiving, being the payee? of checks what's the implications there very good question um so as mentioned the treasury departments tend to try and get away from the uses of checks it's easier to implement such strategy when you're on the payment side because you're like okay i'm not gonna issue checks anymore and whatever people you're paying you're the client so you can say look i'm not paying my checks i'd rather pay you via electronic transfer when it comes to collection, it's a bit trick trickier to be strict on, right? Because some clients may be, okay, no, I, I need or I can not use any other mean of payments than the checks. And as much as a company can enforce its employees not to use checks, it's harder to refuse money from your customers, right? Like always. So first of all, it can also be um, a market practice in certain countries. And therefore, you will need to adapt to this as a company, especially if you are in an industry dealing with individuals um, you must be ready to accept many different forms of payments, including checks. And you might find some similarities with uh, the episodes we published on cash, but it's especially the case here for retail. Whether you are a supermarket or a clothes shop or whatever, you might need to be able to get paid by check because that's some of the individuals out there favorite means of payments. So yeah, it's rather similar as cash, and I guess you can um, see already the implication it has for a corporate treasury department. Well, you get paid later, right? So that doesn't sound nice as a corporate treasurer, right? You yeah, have you to handle them. I mean, to cash it in, yeah. And, and you need someone to go and issue all the checks to the bank, right? Same way we talked about uh, handling cash yeah. from your customers, where you have to mm -hmm. you know, transfer the money to a bank account to be deposited, et cetera. Exactly. Um, same, same problem, right? Just less pieces of paper. One piece of paper represents more on a check, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So mm -hmm. that will mean that having um, a bank branch network or a bank branch nearby your physical shops, right? Uh, as, a, as a first, like let's say you have, I don't know, 50 shops in a country, 100, 500, whatever. If all of them collect checks, well, you need a bank branch not too far from your shops uh, in order to deposit them. So that's that's the first implication. You need to make sure your banking partner can support a broad branch network. Um, you also need potentially a process in place to bring the checks from the shop to the bank branch. We discussed for the cash, but you can either have an employee doing it. It's safer than cash, so you might go for that option. Or you can have a dedicated third-party transporter company making um, the effort for you, coming to your shops, picking up the checks, and depositing them in a bank branch. And also you need a way of doing the reconciliation with the collected checks, right? So it's again, a lot of hustle uh, for, to my eyes, little benefits, but sometimes you do not have the choice. So again, it all Better comes than to- Better cash. Sorry? Right? Like I see it as net, net, better than mm -hmm. cash. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. You'd rather your customers pay you in check versus cash then in that sense, right? Because your fees of transport would be lower and the processing time, okay, maybe it's an extra two days of processing, but 
Uh, and yeah, maybe the check bounces. So that's not uh, that's not so reliable either. Uh, mm-hmm. But if you're a cafe, you'd actually rather that your uh, your customers pay you in checks versus cash, no? But so that's a, that's a very interesting point that you just raised about bouncing. Like when your client pays you in cash, you're sure to have the money. Yes, it will take a little bit of time to mm. deposit it on your bank account. But the checks, you can never be so sure, which is why now a lot of retailers and supermarkets have all this verification process in place where they sometimes ask for an ID um, that they scan and they embed to it like they can retrieve you if the shakes bounce and so on. So it's, mm. it's still rather cumbersome. Now, I'd say as a retail company, if you can only choose between the two, cash and shakes, yes, it might be more interesting to go for shakes. Uh, but it's it's like choosing between one sickness and another, right? So you, you'd rather avoid both. The lesser of the two evils. Ah, the lesser of the two evils, exactly. What's it in French? Say it in French. Um, oh, I wouldn't be able to translate it. In it's like <laughs> no, say it in French, like in uh, French. La peste ou le choléra. So apologies for oh. our English speakers only <laughs> listeners, but uh, yeah, it's two very bad diseases that they had in middle age, and we're like, yeah, it's like to choosing between those two. You want neither. Um, I would say that's a little bit like the same. You'd rather have your customers pay by card, but we're going to see it in another episode that has other implications, mm-hmm. uh, including cost. Um, or, yeah, like e-wallets or this new digital way of payments. But to my eyes, uh, they are not the best when you look at the big, big corporations, but you sometimes do not have the choice, right? You just need to cope with the market practices. Okay, so wh- where are checks still used commonly? So... From the top of my mind, uh, I know that the United States and Canada are for sure still using checks a lot. It is a market, a market practice. Talking from experience here, France also has still <laughs> a lot of checks in place and also in B2B actually, so between companies, not only individuals paying to uh, their local supermarket whatsoever. And to name a few others, uh, Cyprus, Portugal, Singapore and the UK are still fans of, of checks. Now, that being said, um, to start for like the the Western economies, checks would also still be used in um, economies that are still a bit slower, a little bit behind, let's say. So I'm thinking about uh, Latin America or Africa or places like this where electronic channels are not as developed yet. It's it's, it's like work in progress, but it's not there yet. Uh, There you have the choice typically between cash and checks and you need to choose one of the two. And because of safety issues, you might want to go for the checks rather than cash. But the specific type of check, right? The one with the account, which has been verified, which was called a So you have the cash check? check? Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, indeed. So you have this option or the, the normal check as well. And that's, that's still a practice as well. Um, and I know that in Latin America, for instance, it's common to use a post data check because like this, the payee uh, can actually leverage this as um, a, an advance on a payment that they say, look, I have this money, I cannot cash it in yet, but I have it. So just take my check and you you also can cash in this check at a later stage. Mm. So yeah, that's uh, that's from the top of my mind. But again, checks tend to disappear slowly, at least from the Western economy. People are going more and more for uh, electronic formats. It has been accelerated by COVID, obviously, since people weren't going physically in the shops as much as they used to. And yeah, the e-check, so the electronic check, the digital version of it is also taking more and more place in the in the check um, payments world. Makes a lot of sense, Gil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hussam.